Hi, good morning, um, and uh, welcome to our uh, symposium on myelopathy. And, um, you know, we just uh, uh, heard a, a number of uh, papers on patients, you know, presenting with deformity, frailty, very, you know, kind of severe presentation of cervical disorders. We're going to uh, switch gears and talk about patients who actually have much milder uh, issues, but sometimes the imaging looks kind of scary but their clinical presentation is kind of mild. And, you know, this is a dilemma. What do, what do we do with these, um, what do we do with these uh, patients? And so I'm going to um, ask uh, Dr. Jeff Wong, who's also co-moderating this session with me, to kind of present a case to just kind of uh, uh, set us up for some of the subsequent discussions. So I'm going to present a case that I think we've all seen in, in the office. Um, these are my disclosures, which is not going to affect anything I'm going to talk about. So this is a 68-year-old female who, interestingly enough, has a past medical history of a prior caught equina and had some type of decompression done in an outside hospital. But she pre presents to me with really no progressive gait issues, no change in bowel bladder. She really just has some mild numbness in her hands. It's kind of diffuse, doesn't really follow any radicular pattern. She has uh, some mild diffuse radicular symptoms that kind of vaguely go down her arms into her hands. And she is on exam floridly myelopathic. She's got hyperactive reflexes. She's got every reflex she tests is at least three plus or higher. She has uh, Hoffman's reflexes bilaterally, but really no gait disturbances. And uh, on her x-rays, she has just some degenerative changes. Uh, she can still move a little bit. And on the MRI, she's got profound cord compression with cord signal change. And she's a slightly kyphotic, which is um, kind of centered right at the area of the tightest compression. When you look at the uh, cross-section at C3-4, you can see that it's uh, mildly stenotic. But when you look at the area that's most compressed, you can see that it's very, very much compressed and has real cord signal changes in myelomalacia. So the real question in this patient is what to do for this patient. Uh, she's obviously, we've all seen this, they've come into the office and they're seeing you for a second opinion and they said, someone told me I was gonna be paralyzed if I don't have surgery. And so what do we do with this patient? And I think that kind of centers around this symposium. With that, I'd like to introduce Michael Failings to talk about um, what to do with this patient. Thanks, Jeff. So, so just while we're uh, 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 pulling up my slides, um, let me just see a show of hands. So who would operate on this uh, patient based on this kind of clinical presentation? Okay, so a lot, a lot of people. Okay, so be, it'll be interesting kind of to see uh, what your thoughts are. Uh, kind, of, kind of later. So I'll be uh, kind of presenting the argument really around you know when sh uh, you know might might you might you operate and and I think this is really not so much a debate of whether you should operate or you shouldn't it's to try to figure out you know which based on the available knowledge which are the patients that you might want to select for surgical intervention and which are the ones that you know it might be you know a reasonable option uh, you know to to counsel them to 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 wait and to watch so no relevant commercial disclosures and look I'm I'm debating Jeff Wilson. Jeff is brilliant, and in addition, he's got a big uh, multi-center uh, CIHR grant to examine this uh, question in a few years. I think we'll be having some level one evidence to uh, kind of inform this. But, you know, we don't have this right now, so let's uh, see what kind of evidence we have. And so Jeff uh, presented a case. Here's another case that, you know, I, you know I, I've managed um, um, with multi-level spondylosis. Got an MGOA 15, is myelopathic, has got some mild hand intrinsic weakness, and and is kind of presenting in you know in this way. So how do we counsel this patient? Here's the imaging. But let's then uh, flip this around a bit. Let's think about three clinical scenarios. Let's say that okay, same imaging, minimal neck pain, cervical stenosis, no neurological symptoms and signs, or minimal neck pain was with a radiculopathy and cervical stenosis, and then the third one is the one I've presented. And, and the reality is that these are all three nuances uh, of this, and it's really important to try to figure this out because your recommendations are actually going to differ based on that clinical uh, presentation. So we understand, uh, you know, the challenges with degenerative cervical myelopathy, which is now the preferred overarching uh, term. 
Um, this is a leading cause of spinal cord dysfunction globally, and it's a form of non-traumatic spinal cord injury. There's nothing benign about this condition, so we recognize this, right? Uh, it's the questions of the trade-offs of when do you manage, when do you not, when do you not manage. And we recognize that if we don't do correct decision-making and patients are watched to where they have significant impairment, you may have lost a critical window. Right? And so here we have another patient with a signal change. And then again, the, the issues here really are, is it neck pain and no myelopathy? You know, basically those patients, you probably should do some watchful waiting. You may want to do some advanced imaging, and, uh, and uh, Alan Martin will talk about this. If they have radiculopathy, you know, uh, you, you, you might want to weigh in terms of operating on that kind of a patient. They will tend to um, uh, deteriorate over time. And you know what? Very frequently, those patients will kind of want you to operate as well because they have pain. Usually pain's a driver. Minimal myelopathy is it sometimes is a challenge. You may want to recommend surgery, but if the patients don't perceive impairment, they may not want. Uh, to have surgery, and that's often kind of the rate limiter, trying to figure out if this, there's impairment. So I won't steal uh, Alan's uh, uh, thunder, but Alan will talk to us about uh, some uh, you know, microstructural MR approaches. In particular, I think the T2 star weighted white matter, gray matter ratio is attractive. There are ways now to, that you can uh, bring this in, into your own uh, clinic, and this is some of Alan's uh, work that he'll be referring to. Okay, so, so look, this is, this is what the spinal cord looks like probably in the patient that Jeff Wong uh, presented, and that's the lower image there. There's nothing benign about this condition at all, right? And so this is really, you know, kind of uh, uh, where we're looking at the, the judgment. We recognize that there are, that there are biomolecular pathological changes within, within the cord. And, you know, there are some um, things that on a regular MRI, that do suggest that they're bad actors. And a couple of them are if you see a diffuse T2 signal a change, that's so not just kind of a focal, that's kind of a bad actor. And then also if you see these skip lesions that occur, that's a bad actor. And then if you see a combined um, increased T2 and a low T1, that indicates that there's loss of neural tissue as opposed to just edema and inflammation. So those are some things that you know, might sway you toward uh, um, uh, intervening uh, surgically. And, and then, you know, there's, um, uh, you know, the, the data on the natural history are evolving, and, uh, you know, it's imperfect, but this is what we know, is that, um, you know, around 10% of patients will decline at a year, about 25% at, at, four, at four years, and um, probably around half will deteriorate kind of between three and six years. So those are kind of some, some numbers. Um, EMG, uh, evidence of radiculopathy, clinical signs of radiculopathy, do suggest that these patients will have a worse outcome. And so you may be more inclined to counsel those patients towards surgery as opposed to non-operative uh, management. So these are the guidelines that we issued in 2017. This is a combined effort from AO Spine and CSRS. So these are our guidelines. And you'll see that for mild myelopathy, it really depends on the clinician's judgment. It depends on how the patient is feeling about this. And you can go either way in terms of kind of recommending operative intervention or perhaps a period of non-operative management with, with careful follow-up. And this, this clearly represents kind of a knowledge Gap, And so I'll share with you some of our, our work from our, our uh, prospective AO uh, study. So this is from a large prospective data set of 757 uh, patients, 193 with mild DCM. Uh, we had a number of uh, outcome uh, 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 measures. And then we were using SF36 uh, scores in particular to assess the functional um, uh, 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 Im impact uh, of, 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 of this. I think the point I want to make here is that although we feel that patients with mild DCM have mild impairment, um, so a lot of these patients actually report substantial impairment in quality of life. And so, you know, a lot of us are doing proms in the clinic as part of our kind of standard of care. Have a look at the SF36 scores. Look at the physical 
and mental component scores. And if, and if those are down quite a bit, that's telling you that the patient perceives that they have a lot of impairment. And those patients likely will benefit uh, from, sur from, uh, from surgery. You know, it's a busy table, but the bottom line here is that surgical decompression does improve function, disability, and quality of life in the majority of patients with degenerative cervical myelopathy. But the patients are heterogeneous, and the outcomes are, are heterogeneous. So, so not everyone has this uh, benefit. And so, you know, how do you refine your decision making? And so this was an example here of, of using uh, some machine learning uh, algorithms to try to plot out the types of factors that might predict which patients with mild myelopathy are going to do better. And so some of the negative predictors are age. There's a lot of medical comorbidities, including diabetes, if patients are heavy smokers. You know, that's not to say that you're not going to operate, but just be careful because, you, you know, you might want to consider uh, management of patient expectations, um, you know, an ERAS protocol, that type of thing. Um, and then very interestingly, um, uh, the anterior surgical approaches appear to have a better outcome in these patients with mild myelopathy. And this might be uh, because these patients are presenting with pain predominantly when they want you to operate on them. So, so that was an interesting result and we've seen this now consistently kind of coming out. So a couple of the things to look at in the clinic is if they perceive that their, that their impairment is substantial, so you could use, for example, the PCS domain and the SF36, and you can look at the NDI. And if those two things are out of whack, then, then that's probably quite reasonable to consider the surgery. So you need to look at the imaging and the clinical exam, but you have to ask the patient, are you impaired? And these are some tools that you can use objectively. So, so here's back to the case that I referred to, and essentially we, did, we operated on her. She did, you know, we, um, uh, we, we had a discussion, we did an anterior cervical approach, and fortunately a good outcome. This is some of Alan's work, Alan Martin's work, uh, when he was with us in Toronto, and not, not all of these cases have such a benign prognosis. Now, the caveat here is all of these patients were referred to us by and large, we usually will recommend surgery, not always, and, uh, and we followed them. And about 50% of the patients uh, ended up declining over about two years and re requiring surgery. So, you know, just be aware of this as well. So surgical decompression is safe and effective for mild DCM, but it's a heterogeneous population, okay? So you need to use a lot of clinical judgment. Pain on steady gait, weakness, female gender, appear to be associated with greater baseline impairment, and these also will drive surgical intervention, particularly pain. And, and if patients feel that they have impairments, say on the SF36 and the NDI, that's, that's helpful. And, and often with mild DCM, think about the anterior approach. It's a beautiful operation. Patients have very little pain perioperatively, and it appears to be a more optimal approach uh, for, uh, for these cases. So thanks very much. Up next, uh, to present kind of the, you know, the, the argument for when you might pursue non-operative approaches will be uh, Jeff Wilson um, at the, from the University of Toronto. So thank you very much. Um, just to start off with disclosures, I think we should all kind of acknowledge that as cervical spine surgeons, we're all slightly conflicted insofar as we get paid to operate on people's necks. Michael and I are a little less conflicted because we get paid in Canadian dollars, but nonetheless, a conflict that uh, still does exist. Um, so I think we're all familiar with this, that there is a spectrum of disease, and patients range from severely impacted to, to minimally impaired. And I think with the increased ubiquity and accessibility of neuroimaging, we're increasingly seeing patients on the mild side of things with canal stenosis, mild symptoms. In fact, um, some image, neuroimaging studies would suggest that the lifetime incidence of cervical stenosis is around 24%. And of course, not all of these patients will become myelopathic, but a proportion of them will develop neurologic symptoms and end up in a spine surgery clinic near you. So there's a strong imperative to, I think, develop a deeper understanding of how to optimally manage these patients. And I think there are certain unique considerations for this group. The first and most glaring is that they're mild. So they harbor less disability. Many of them are very functional and active. Some of them are working, supporting families. So it's a higher stakes game, both from an operative and non-operative perspective. The other key thing is that 
in contrast to, say, treatment of cervical radiculopathy or in the lumbar spine, neurogenic claudication or radicular symptoms, where the treatment goal is amelioration of symptoms, in the context of mild myelopathy, the primary goal is functional preservation, so averting future deterioration, whether it's progression of myelopathy or spinal cord injury. So if we're, in order to meaningfully counsel these patients, we better have a pretty good understanding of what the incidence or rate of these sort of deterioration events are. So just to kind of frame the conundrum, I think, um, this is a patient of, of my own. So it was a 45-year-old professional, had some stable numbness in his hand for about a year, had an MRI which showed two-level cord compression. He had a Hoffman on, on one side, mild myelopathy. He was um, uh, offered surgery at another hospital. He came for a second opinion. And the patient is very ambivalent and anxious about going ahead with surgery. He just started a new firm. He has young kids. And he asked, Doc, can surgery wait? I think when we're talking about non-operative management, it's, you have to, we have to be very clear about what we mean by that and what we don't mean by that. So non-operative management does not mean no surgery ever. We don't say, sorry, sir, you're not a candidate for surgery and ride off into the sunset. That's not what we mean. What we do mean is that no surgery now with counseling, education, close follow-up, and obviously surgery if deterioration occurs. So when you posed your, your case, I didn't put my hand up to offer surgery. And that doesn't mean that I would never operate on that patient. Of course I would. But I think in that context, when patient is doing quite well, functional and active, why not start with observation and see how they do? So when framed through that lens, I think most of us can agree that starting with this non-operative approach is very reasonable and tenable. And when we look at the um, arguments for and against, I think the crux of this with respect to evidence is what is the natural history without surgery? We looked at this when we were putting together the um, guidelines for cervical myelopathy management a few years back. The evidence in general is quite poor. The, as Dr. Failings alluded to, 20 to 62 percent of patients will deteriorate over a three to six year period. It's kind of imprecise, not very useful. This wasn't just looking at mild patients, it was looking at all patients of, of different severities. So that's kind of home in a little bit on specific studies that look at mild patients. And I think some of the best evidence available is now somewhat old, but still uh, remains very true to this day. So this is Kadanka's series of studies. He actually took patients with milder myelopathy, 68 of them, and randomized them to operative versus non-operative care. And at three years, not only did the patients who didn't have surgery remain stable, there was actually a trend to improve, improved functional outcomes amongst those who had non-operative care as compared to operative care. And then the, he continued to follow this group up to 10 years. Of course, there were some patients lost to follow-up, but the results remained stable. That is, patients treated non-operatively on average did not deteriorate, and in fact, there's a continued trend towards improved outcomes in those who did not have surgery. This is another older study in Japan, looked at 63 patients with uh, myelopathy treated non-operatively, some, um, some of whom were mild. Only 3% deteriorated, and in fact, mild initial symptoms was a, a, a positive predictor of successful treatment with non-operative care. This is an, a more recent study given, uh, written by Dr. Martin, who's a panelist here today. And 117 patients followed over time. Um, and interestingly, in this study, they moved beyond MJOA. So they looked at more granular assessment of outcome, including hand function, walking, balance, and they found a greater risk of deterioration over time. In fact, 57% deteriorated, deteriorated over time, suggesting that it really depends on what we measure, that things like grip strength, dexterity are more sensitive for capturing change. Patients may get worse, but what I found particularly illuminating in this uh, paper was that if you looked at how they deteriorated, only one patient experienced a very sudden, severe drop in, in their neurologic function, suggesting that in the context of a uh, system where you can closely watch, monitor, counsel these patients, we should be able to recognize and intervene in the cases of, uh, with surgery in the cases of deterioration and, and avert any significant disability from developing. So a proportion of patients will get worse, of course, it depends what you measure, but sudden development of severe disability is rare. We also get worried about uh, spinal cord injury if patients, for instance, fall and have a trauma. Fortunately, the evidence shows that that's not really an issue. So this is a great study by Langston Hawley's group, 55 patients with significant canal uh, stenosis, mild symptoms. Uh, Ten of these actually had a trauma during follow-up, and no patients experienced a significant spinal cord injury. This is a similar patient in pre-symptomatic patients with um, non-myelopathic patients with severe stenosis. Again, 14 uh, patients had significant trauma during the follow-up, and none of them had a very severe or catastrophic spinal cord injury. 
at a population level. This uh, study is often quoted. It's from Taiwan, and it looked at and it showed that patients who were admitted to hospital who had surgery experienced a lower chance of subsequent spinal cord injury as compared to those who were admitted to hospital with myelopathy who did not have surgery. But this isn't really relevant for mild myelopathy because, let's face it, patients with mild myelopathy would never be admitted to the hospital. So it's not generalizable to the mild group. We've seen a lot of studies that have shown that surgery can be performed safely and effectively in patients with mild cervical myelopathy. But I think it's important to remember that most of these studies are uncontrolled. There's no basis for comparison. So all the, although the patients do quite well, we're not really comparing them to anything, especially we're not comparing them to patients who had this non-operative watchful waiting approach. And so we can't use these studies to justify operative intervention in all people with mild DCM. And in fact, we know that surgery usually goes well, but it isn't innocuous sometimes. We know that the risk of complications is about 15 to 20 percent, with about a third of these being serious or severe. So we can't minimize that either. So in conclusion, Non-operative care does not mean that we will never operate on the patient. It means that it is initially reasonable to closely observe, educate, monitor patients for signs of deterioration. And in this context, it's unlikely to have a patient that experiences a very severe, dramatic uh, downturn or, or disability. It is true, though, however, that if you are monitoring patients in this context, surgery should be recommended for patients who are, who are deteriorating. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you very much. The next talk is going to be given by J.J. Abbott Ball. He's going to talk about get best clinical diagnostic tools to detect <coughs> and monitor progression in mild degenerative cervical myelopathy. <clears throat> Thanks, Jeff. So um, next few moments, I'm just going to go over some uh, basic clinical tests, many of which uh, you know, but perhaps as it pertains to mild DCM and uh, its application, there are just sort of uh, as a forefront, there's really no perfect test to evaluate it, but um, a combination of these would help. Here are my disclosures, none of which have to do with this. And if um, just one, t one paper you're going to read uh, to, dis uh, to uh, get familiar with these, it's this paper right here. And I think uh, Michael uh, uh, was one of the co-authors and presented some of it. And I'll um, deal with the uh, clinical uh, uh, findings. So, uh, the goals of these uh, tools, of these clinical tools, uh, to assess mild DCM are, are to assess disease severity and its progression and to evaluate effective treatment. So if you are going to do surgery, then post-op evaluation and see if your surgery uh, work, and that can assist in future uh, surgery. As far as the assessment tools that I'll uh, give you an overview on, can divide them up into two patient reported outcome measures and clinic, uh, clinician reported outcome measures. Um, so from, uh, we all know about the uh, NDI. Uh, it's a questionnaire. It's pretty easy to fill out. It has a high test re reliability. It's internally consistent. And it consists of a single dimension. So it's pretty uh, straightforward. <coughs> its major limitation, though, is that the NDI is, th is just that. It evaluates the neck and doesn't evaluate the upper lower extremities as it pertains to the uh, ADL. So it's got uh, some limited value. What about the uh, quick dash? Uh, that evaluates the upper musculature. It's self-administered and uh, related to the arm, shoulder, and hand muscles. So it doesn't, uh, inv it doesn't deal with the lower extremities at all. It's validated for use in DCM, and it's able to discriminate between mild, moderate, and severe disease. So this is something that can be uh, quite helpful in uh, mild DCM. Uh, the short version, uh, short form 36, version 2, um, it's, uh, I think we're all familiar with it. Um, it is uh, internally consistent and high test reliability. And it's often used to validate other uh, assessment tools used to evaluate patients with DCM. The problem is getting patients to cooperate to fill out this form. Uh, and that's the, uh, the big deal. VAS scores, we know those. They rank from uh, 1 to 10 according to uh, your intensity of pain. Simple and e efficient. It's more sensitive to small changes than other descriptive scales. The problem is um, it is highly subjective and influenced by environment, uh, time of day, and patient demographics. What are some of the clinician uh, reported outcome measures? we can use. We heard about the MJOA, 
which is more compatible with Western uh, societies. It's got a moderate internal uh, consistencies, but it has a good inter uh, rate of reliability, and uh, with the exception of upper extremity sensory function, and it's responsive to change. The problem with it, though, is that although uh, the score is ordinal, uh, it, is, it is not linear in terms of impact on quality of life and need for surgical intervention. For example, a one-point uh, change can reflect the difference between um, buttoning a shirt with mild versus great difficulty or walking uh, with a walk or not walking at all. It also has a ceiling effect, uh, um, which is, uh, it, it is difficult to, to uh, detect subtle improvements in patients with milder disease. So it does have a limitation when you're dealing with mild DCM. Gait assessment has shown uh, promise. I mean, the easiest one is the 30-meter walk test uh, that's uh, easy to use. Uh, you don't need any elaborate equipment. Uh, it's just really an observation of how many strides within that distance and how long it took you to, to walk that distance. So it's pretty easy to use. You have minimal equipment. Um, the problem is it's not responsive to change, as responsive to change visually, uh, and which can limit its uh, use in patients with myelopathy, especially uh, mild uh, DCM. I think it's more useful in the moderate to severe forms as opposed to the mild form. What's showing promise, though expensive and elaborate, are these three-dimensional motion capture with uh, sensory uh, plates. This is from Izzy Lieberman's uh, lab in Texas, and he's done some pretty good work uh, with this. He studied patients with cervical uh, myelopathy pre- and post-operatively, and what shows promise is that you can evaluate uh, patients with mild DCM, and he's been able to show that. And he's also been able to show their, um, uh, their variation in, in gait and um, how it improves postoperatively, as you see here. The problem is it's expense. It's difficult to set up. Um, you need a lab. And perhaps one day, with, uh, as cost comes down, uh, this, can be, um, this can be populated and a referral center uh, type situation. What about neurophysiological measures? We know with uh, DCM you get electrical activity abnormalities, and that will give you abnormalities in EMGs, <coughs> nerve, conduction, uh, uh, nerve conduction velocities, MEPs, and SSEPs. Uh, they've been so shown to be useful preoperatively in detecting DCM and differentiating it from other neurological diseases. Intraoperatively, they've been found to be useful, and postoperatively, uh, they can monitor disease progression. The problem is uh, there are a lot of false positives and negatives with these tests. It is very examiner dependent and very experience uh, de dependent. Comorbidities, diabetes, chronicity of the problem of the compression uh, can influence the test results. Also the ones, that, the tests that you want, the MEPs and SEPs are very difficult, especially the MEPs to ascertain clinically. You can use a magnet, uh, but again, it's, it's a very difficult test to uh, accomplish with an awake patient. So it has um, best applications are in moderate to severe DCM. In milder forms, it's uh, not as good. Uh, the GRIP uh, dynamometer, I don't think I need to exhaust that. We know that you get intrinsic um, weakness with uh, DCM and this could be a great tool to follow the patient with. There are several of them available. None of them have been validated in a DCM population. So really in conclusion, there's no perfect clinical test. I think using a series of these along with repeated clinical examination, if you're gonna follow, follow those mild DCMs as was outlined uh, before, thank you. The next speaker is uh, Dr. Alan Martin who's with the Department of uh, Neurosurgery at UC Davis uh, and um, graduate from the uh, Toronto program, I'm proud to say. And uh, Alan will is really a world expert in the use of advanced microstructural MR uh, uh, imaging, and he'll uh, kind of share some of that expertise uh, with us in the context of mild DCM. Okay, well, thank you so much for the invitation to present. Um, so I'll be talking about the clinical use of micro, microstructural MRI 
to assist decision making in mild DCM. Uh, no commercial disclosures, just want to acknowledge AO Spine for a grant for developing a new outcome measure, a clinical outcome measure that might be helpful and relevant to JJ's talk. I um, want to acknowledge my uh, team in my lab at UC Davis and also Dr. Failings as my PhD supervisor. A lot of this work references the stuff I did back in Toronto. So DCM, as you all know, is uh, relatively common. Um, I won't bore you with uh, rehashing what you've already heard. Uh, I think the most important thing to focus on is that mild DCM is the most interesting from a research point of view and from uh, uncertainty with what we should do, so that's why we're here today. Um, and specifically, the, the word deterioration bothers me. What is deterioration? How do we define that? So defining mild DCM and defining deterioration are going to be a lot of what I talk about today. So some open questions. How can diagnosis of mild DCM be made more reliable? Um, do we even have diagnostic criteria? Well, we're working on that through our spine. Uh, but how mild is really relevant? If someone has transient symptoms that go away, are they symptomatic? Are they not? Is that something we should follow? And then what about all the competing diagnoses that affect our assessments? Uh, every single thing that JJ mentioned is, is vulnerable to these other diagnoses. And unfortunately, DCM affects older patients with many comorbidities. And so our assessment is cloudy. It's, it's uncertain. Um, more on the deterioration topic, you know, how is that defined? Is it subjective? Is the patient's own awareness uh, more relevant than objective measures? Is the MJOA good enough? Um, we know that it's not perfectly reliable. And uh, what objective measures can we supplement it with? So in my lab at UC Davis, we're doing a lot of stuff. So um, I'm going to focus on microstructural MRI today. But uh, you know, we're also looking at enhanced clinical measures and then looking at other ways, uh, many of the things you've already heard about, to supplement these assessments and really try to get at the, the core. And this is because we don't have ground truth data about how impaired the spinal cord really is in, in a given individual. So one thing to go back to uh, conventional MRI, signal change on T1-weighted and T2-weighted imaging tells you a little bit about the spinal cord. Um, T1-weighted hypointensity is relevant and it does show cellular loss and cavitation. Um, those are uh, indicative of, of greater severity and a worse uh, post-operative outcome, less recovery potential after surgery. So T1-weighted hypointensity is important. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it only occurs in about 5 or 10% of patients in modern papers because we get to these patients before they develop that. The presence of T2-weighted hyperintensity, with the exception of some of the things Dr. Failings mentioned earlier, in isolation at a single level really adds nothing to, to the assessment of this patient. It doesn't uh, pretend any prognos prognostic information and it does correlate only with slightly worse clinical findings at presentation. So it just really doesn't tell us very much about what's going on inside that spinal cord. So the good news is we have better methods. Um, there's this whole world of MR research with quantitative and microstructural techniques including diffusion tensor imaging, myelin imaging, um, a lot of other cool stuff. Check out these papers written way back in 2014 describing the future of spinal cord MRI um, and a lot of exciting technical stuff. Unfortunately, we're pretty far from clinical translation of those. So we set out during my PhD time to make a clinically feasible microstru microstructural MRI protocol that included anatomical imaging. We looked at cross-sectional area and compression and you know, focal things like atrophy. Um, we looked at myelin imaging with magnetization transfer. We did diffusion tensor imaging, uh, a quantitative version, not tractography. And we also created a new biomarker, this T2 star weighted white to gray ratio, which is like gray white contrast and stroke. And it's indicative of demyelination, gliosis, and other changes. Um, subsequently, an uh, international group led by Julian Cohen Adad, my wonderful collaborator, um, has published this as a consensus protocol, so more than 50 research groups around the world are now using this and collecting high quality data in the cervical spinal cord with this protocol and, and in all sorts of different diseases and healthy subjects. So it's, it's, it's getting close. In, our, in my own work, we use this as a diagnostic tool in de degenerative cervical myelopathy in a sample of 98 subjects. So this was uh, 58 uh, myelopathy subjects and um, 
30 healthy controls and we, we did uh, various diagnostic models with a support vector machine classifier. We had 95 plus percent accuracy in, in classifying um, using a, a validation method, uh, bootstrap. And then we narrowed the, this model down to borderline cases. These were healthy subjects who had a little bit of spinal cord deformation, 20 of those, and 35 mild DCM patients, and it still had 91 percent accuracy. So it was sort of a proof of concept that we can do a pretty good job of diagnosing symptomatic myelopathy with uh, this looking directly inside the spinal cord at the tissue injury. We then looked at healthy subjects, and we even found differences in healthy subjects. So at a group level, we found differences between 20 uh, healthy subjects that had mild spinal cord indentation or flattening compared to totally uncompressed cords. And then even on an individual level, if you look at the bars here, um, when we revised the composite score and kicked out um, one of the measures that didn't perform well, uh, we could actually, in individual subjects, like yourselves sitting in the room with no symptoms, we could diagnose uh, with statistical significance that individuals had abnormal spinal cords, had tissue injury before they have symptoms. So I thought that was kind of cool. So where is this going? Well, some conclusions we can draw. Microstructural MRI does appear capable of diagnosing preclinical or subclinical tissue injury. And really, the spinal cord exists on this continuum between normal and abnormal. And it makes you kind of rethink what aging is. We're all aging. We're all accumulating pathology. And we have to hit a certain threshold, like in diabetes, before we have symptoms. Um, so this uh, opens more questions. What constitutes a meaningful diagnostic threshold? It's, it's kind of arbitrary. Is it when you have persistent symptoms? Is it intermittent symptoms? It's challenging. Uh, and at what point do we uh, operate on patients? So I don't know the answers to these. Hopefully someone will help me figure it out. Um, we also use this to monitor DCM patients over time. And uh, actually, it worked really well. It, it was a, a perfect superset of patients that deteriorated with microstructural imaging that subjectively deteriorated. So patients that felt they were worse constituted 42% of this small group. It was 26 patients. So uh, 12 of them felt subjectively worse. And all of those 12 uh, plus some other ones got worse on microstructural MRI. Um, it performed better than robust clinical measures. Um, so that, that was uh, reassuring. So uh, we came up with this algorithm as a proposal how to use this in a clinical setting to monitor for deterioration. <laughs> and this is really just as an adjunct. It doesn't replace clinical decision making. And now we're, we've implemented it. So at UC Davis, I convinced the radiologist that this was a smart idea. And we're implemented as a clinical scan. And we've obtained it in 31 patients, planning to follow these patients over time. And then we're also using it to try to enhance diagnosis in borderline cases or um, patients that are very mild. Um, so we think that this is the first actual clinical implementation of this. But it's early, and it still goes to my lab to get processed. And the, the analysis is a, is a huge pain. So future directions, we want to validate this with robust clinical measures still. Further validation, we want to improve the acquisitions, they're constantly improving. We want to improve the analysis and make it simpler. And then we really want to convince clinicians like yourselves that this is a good idea and that other centers should take up this effort. Um, then we also want to apply it to traumatic spinal cord injury and, and other diseases. So promising results. Thank you for your time. I know I've probably gone over. So uh, to come back to the case, uh, we'll have our co-moderator, Dr. Wong, uh, present uh, uh, the scenario. Okay, so I changed this last night. So this is the real story on this patient. This patient is 100% asymptomatic. She has no gait disturbance, has no numbness, no radicular symptoms. She is 100% asymptomatic. She has no neck pain. Okay. Um, on her exam, she's not hyperreflexic. She has a mildly positive Hoffman's on both sides, and that's it. So I want to retake the vote. Remember completely asymptomatic, and it's very, very tight. There's cord signal change. How many people would strongly recommend surgery if this were your patient? Okay. How many people would not recommend surgery and just re recommend observation? Okay. It's food for thought. I changed it last night because this is a symposium on myelopathy. I wanted to make sure she was myelopathic. But with that, thank you very much. I think, uh, you know, I think Jeff's case highlights the fact that 
you know, you know, the imaging is really helpful, but it's also kind of the clinical scenario. And I think, you know, with the case that, that Jeff highlighted, as 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 um, as uh, uh, Jeff Wilson, you know, has indicated, initial non-operative -op management doesn't necessarily mean the patient's not going to require surgery. I, I mean. You know, I mean, that's a pretty scary looking uh, MR. So, JJ, you had a yeah. comment, and then uh, we'll go to the floor. Just a quick comment, and I want uh, Jefferson to actually comment on that. I had the exact same patient that Jeff presented with, and a patient presented uh, to another physician, and the physician told, him, told her, either you have the operation, you're going to go paralyzed if you fall or do something. And it's not the first time, I'm sure many of you have seen the same scenario, where you see somebody with minimal symptoms just like this, and then they're told they're going to go paralyzed if they don't have an operation. So Jefferson, can you address that? Because I saw a couple of papers that you had um, that kind of addressed the trauma situation. Yeah, I mean, we hear this a lot. And I don't think that the doctor that told them that is, you know, um, lying or acting in bad faith. And, you know, there, there is some concern. I, the studies suggest that the risk is low. Um, but, you know, we have to counterbalance that with our clinical experiences that we see patients coming in with, you know, narrow spinal canals and central cord syndrome, syndrome all the time. And presumably those patients may have had some mild symptoms before the fall. So I don't think we can say the risk is zero. I just don't think that we can say that um, surgery is justified in those patients to obviate the chance of a spinal cord injury down the road. Uh, from the floor. Michael. Uh, Michael Gerling from New York. Um, I think this is an awesome symposium <clears throat> because, uh, I mean, obviously that this is one of the difficult decisions we all face. A lot of these decisions are straightforward uh, with more moderate and severe disease. Um, but to, a comment and then a question. First of all, I, I was impressed, Michael, um, that, you, uh, that you seem to feel that the SF36 uh, is helpful to you. Because in my population in New York City, I feel like they have so many other things whenever they present to me that would confound the results of an SF36. And I mean, maybe to track them over time, and if they say, well, everything else has not changed, and then you're trying to follow them over time, I could see that. But I just don't, I just feel like it's so abstract. And I'm, so I appreciate the fact that you're, we're looking for other more sensitive tools to try and follow these patients and sort of tease out which ones would benefit more from surgery. Um, but the question I have, and Jeff Wilson in particular, um, a great talk. Um, some of my patients have had numbness in their hand for a month, and then some of them have had numbness in their hands for eight months. So the one, for one month, if I follow them for six months, they're still not at the eight-month point. You know, so how long do you think it's reasonable to follow a person that has numbness in their hand? I mean, I don't want to have numbness in my hand, and it distracts me, especially if it's my dominant hand. Um, so these symptoms may seem mild in the big picture of things, but they do seem like they're very distracting and disturbing to people. And, um, and then in, in the context of the fact that you're waiting for things to progress or get worse, and they, you know, what do you tell your patients that, that have this mild numbness in their hand, they've had it for six months, and you know the statistic that about half of them over the course of three to six years are going to get worse do you tell them do you tell them that well if you get worse and i do surgery on you you're going to go back to where you would be if i did your surgery today or like how, how do you counsel them in that regard yeah. yeah it's a difficult scenario i think um the conversation is different for different patients i mean and uh, all is to say like i don't think operating on any of these patients is wrong like i think it's 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 a valid option um so if somebody comes with numbness in their hands and and, you know, it's mild, objectively, but it's bothersome to them. I think it's very reasonable to operate. I don't think we can say with certainty that that numbness is definitely going to get better. The evidence does suggest that probably they will have some improvement in the symptoms, but likely not complete resolution. Some of them do. But, you know, if you have that same situation in, say, a 7-year-old, and they have numbness in the hand, and it's been stable for a year, even if it's been stable for six months, I don't think it's wrong to watch and wait and see how things go. It really, it's an individualized conversation for each person. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all advice for, for what you're asking. Um, I think, though, that the thing that concerns me a lot is when somebody comes in 
and says they had numbness in their thumb three months ago, and now two months ago they have numbness in their whole hand, and now the numbness is proceeding up, up the arm. And even though they're an MJOA 16, 17, that pattern of progression worries me, and I would recommend surgery for that person. So it's more so the progression of things over time rather than the symptoms in isolation. But yeah, and I think that, you know, the key, and, you know, I take what y your point, you know, with regard to the limitations of PROMs that people have got a lot of other comor comorbidities, like, that's fair enough. But, you know, say with the case that you're talking about, I, I mean, I think the point is, is that to one person, it, you know, they, they may, it might not matter that their hand's numb. To somebody else, it might matter a lot. And you can ask them, how concerned are you about it? And I think if the patient is really concerned, and I think if, you know, they feel that it's limiting them, then I, I, I think that's a, that is a very reasonable, you know, option to proceed with surgery. So that's why it's kind of getting out with the individualizing the treatment. And, you know, I'm not here to sell the SF36. Obviously, all problems have got their limitations, you know, yeah. et cetera. Da uh, uh, David. But I'm sorry, just before you go on, though, but, but just the most important thing about the answer for me is what do you tell them about if they do get worse, whether or not they will have subsequent resolution with surgery. In other words, what is their, that's, that was the most important thing I wanted to get to, is what is their prognosis if they get worse, you know, with surgery thereafter? Okay, maybe a brief, a brief, brief response, Jeff? Yeah, I, I don't think we know for sure. I, I think that some people will get back to where they, better than they were before. Some people will be normal, but some won't. So I don't think we can state in absolute terms that, with respect to that question. Some may get better, some may not. And it's hard to predict, you know, where they'll fall on that continuum. On average, 70% of patients uh, will report that the improvements meet kind of what they determine to be functionally significant. Okay, so not everybody, but the majority. And, and there are also studies that show that your um, patient satisfaction with their outcomes are different or worse if the symptoms have progressed before they had surgery. So that's another concern. Anyway, just a comment. I think just one other point, though, is, you know, we know even, you know, a lot of patients with mild myelopathy and surgery do well, but we also know about 30% of them don't do well with surgery. Yep. That, you know, they have neck pain, you know, impaired quality of life. So you have to counterbalance the argument with that. Just because we do surgery doesn't mean you're going to do great another point. All right. Uh, I think we should move on. Okay. David Chan from Hong Kong. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you. It's a great symposium. Um, I want to, um, it's interesting to see um, JOA was not mentioned in the assessment panel because for my, um, myopathy, especially like in Japan or Korea or in Hong Kong, we are still using the JOA score and it's uh, very sensitive in picking up those patients with um, like continuous, like once they can't use the chopsticks or like bundling and they start using the spoon or the forks, then we know uh, uh, this is like, very sensitive in picking up um, those group of patients. So like, I know this is like C-spine um, research society. Like, do you think uh, in the long run, uh, GOA is still part of the assessment panel? Uh, do you want to maybe comment, JJ, and then Alan? Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I did mention it in my talk, uh, just brought up the uh, MJOA. I think it has a clearly um, indication uh, for patients with myelopathy and support its use. I think in milder forms, it may have limitations. In moderate to severe, its application is better. But yeah, as I presented, yes, it's, it's a valuable tool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, question over here. Yes, Fred Harrington from uh, New York. I just have an observation that I've had a few patients over the years who present with an anterior spinal artery type syndrome without trauma. And what that suggests to me that maybe the, the vascular hypothesis here is something we maybe should spend a little more time on. Should we develop some blood flow uh, measurement, some quantitative blood flow measurement uh, type of technology for this problem? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there's a number of groups that have done that already. Um, I think Langston Hawley's group at UCLA has, has done a study on that using uh, dynamic contrast enhanced MRI to look at perfusion of the cord and, and look at perfusion deficits. I know I was trying to get that going and we were also looking, there's a couple PET <laughs> studies that look at perfusion and metabolism, um, but the work's early and, and more needs to be done for sure. It, there likely is, is a, uh, you know, a hypoperfusion effect 
in some patients, but not all patients. There's also dynamic trauma and other factors. So, um, but I think it's it's an important consideration that hasn't been really worked out yet. The other the other part of the vascular piece is also the venous side and the the blood spinal cord barrier because, mm -hmm. um, you know, we 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 probably should be thinking a bit more about you know chronic disruption of the blood spinal cord barrier because some of the inflammatory consequences of that might increase risk, for example, de delayed C5 palsy yeah. and the, those sorts of issues. I'm actually reviewing a paper right now on yeah. disruption of blood, blood yeah. spinal cord barrier. Very good. Uh, question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Mohamed Mackey, I'm uh, one of the spine fellows at UCSF. A question for Dr. Failings. You had said that patients who have uh, cervical spondylitic myelopathy do better with anterior approaches rather than posterior approaches. Are you speaking from anecdotal experience or from literature? And, and the second question was, um, you mentioned about pain. Um, is there any evidence to suggest that they do better from a, a myelopathy standpoint, or is it just from uh, the pain? Thank you. Yeah, so, so it wasn't for all comers with degenerative cervical myelopathy, because for all comers, the evidence would kind of indicate that there's relative equipoise between anterior and posterior. So our, our studies, um, you know, Zoe's uh, trial recently. I was talking more about the mild myelopathy work, and, and yeah, so the evidence, I, I very briefly presented, you know, um, you know, one of the papers using, using a machine learning uh, uh, approach and looking at the way patients cluster. In the mild myelopathy patients, a lot, the big driver uh, often for surgery is pain. And they do appear to do better with the anterior approaches. And Jeff, if I'm not mistaken, I think you may have something uh, similar to that that you're that, um, working on. Maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm thinking about some of our work that you're co-author on. Yeah. Yeah, and no, I, th I think, I mean, they actually, it's a poster here. Uh, it looks at the combined AO data and specifically mild myelopathy looking at trajectories of yeah. uh, uh, outcome over time. And again, about 30 percent have a, a, after surgery with mild myelopathy have a, a negative trajectory. They, they get worse over time. And some of the predictors, one of the predictors of that was actually posterior surgery. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that, so just as a pearl, okay? So <laughs> the evidence is emerging there with mild myelopathy. Okay, uh, Jim, Jim Harrop, our president. Yeah, Jim Harrop from Philadelphia. Uh, love the symposium. Real quick comment, and Dr. Moses' head might pop off when I say this, but I'll say it. <laughs> Watching myelopathy patients for a long time, and I follow a lot of patients non-operatively, the neurologic exam is not static meaning that you'll see a patient one day and you'll get an exam three months later and it'll be a different exam and it might be improved. I guess one, I want you to comment on that. And two, most importantly to me is, how do you follow these patients? Because I usually don't see them for six months and I have my own scenario what I tell them, but what do you guys tell them to look out for? Who wants to handle that one? True or false, Dr. Moses. Uh, JJ? Well, I, I'll, that's a really good question, but if I see yeah, the mild ones, I, I think moderate and severe, pretty much you know. Um, I will see them every three months for the first year. Um, and I will follow them uh, depending on how they do. Uh, after that, I may lengthen that. But I follow them every three months. I can just. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead yeah. Al. Yep. So, uh, Alan Martin at UC Davis, uh, I'm running a prospective study where we're following these patients every six months and doing like a one hour long comprehensive assessment and trying to figure out what's relevant to, to follow. Um, there's a, a number of muscle groups that we think deteriorate slowly, like hand grip, and we published that previously. So grip dynamometer is a good way to follow these patients. Hand intrinsics slowly get subtly worse. Um, you know, their reflexes do change over time. Uh, their gait is really important, so we're coming up with a measure that doesn't require the expensive equipment to try to watch their gait over time, tandem, and actually score it. Um, but it's difficult, so uh, that, I don't think everyone can spend an hour on each of these patients, but we're trying to come up with a five or ten minute exam that, that can do that. So. Very good. Uh, question you. over here. Sure. Damon Marr from the University of Kansas Medical Center and also of note recently completed time at the Texas Back Institute. Uh, Mike, this has been a phenomenal session. It's very informative. Uh, I had a comment for the diagnostic tools talk. Um, we appreciate the shout out. Um, Lieberman definitely appreciates uh, his uh, views being shared. Um, and I kind of want to um, hopefully just share a comment of optimism that we're actively working on several you know, approaches to improving the ability to make objective measures available to like the daily practice. And honestly, the, the ability of your, what we carry in our pockets with our phones now is 
more than enough to achieve a lot of the metrics that we've already been working on. And a lot of this really has to do with refining our understanding of you know, things like balance characteristics during sway, like or sway characteristics during balance, and with things like simplified gate assessments. And so the, the, the bar to entry is much lower than it, it, it used to be, and it's you know, quite accessible at this point. So just to appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, you know, the, the, there's a lot of interest in potential smartphone applications to you know, kind of assess movement and gait and so on. Okay, so uh, very briefly, uh, two, uh, two last uh, kind of brief questions or comments. Yeah, I, uh, Bob Hart from Seattle. I, uh, mine is a comment, and I'll keep it very brief. Um, you know, I, I'm sitting here doing the math, and I realized that the first time I attended this meeting was now 25 years ago when I was a fellow, and that math uh, staggers me. But the, the conclusion I want to bring out of it is I think nearly every year we have this debate, and uh, nearly every year the conclusions are pretty much still the same as they were 25 <laughs> years ago. And the vote, the vote on the cases is also pretty close to 50-50 every year. So. I wanted to submit this topic as the operative definition of clinical equipoise. And with that, I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Moses. <clears throat> Dr. Mo Dr. Moses. Very quickly, uh, regarding <clears throat> the gentleman who described a patient with numbness in a hand, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Just because they're seeing an orthopedic surgeon doesn't mean that the surgeon understands why the patient has a numb hand. It could be a carpal tunnel syndrome, a cubital tunnel syndrome, an asymmetric neuropathy. It could be either cord compression or root compression. That's right. You really have to work with a neurologist to define what you're dealing with. Assuming you get the correct answer and you do relieve the cause of the numbness, it may never go away because you may have irreparable cord, root, or peripheral nerve compression. But the comment, you have to understand what the patient asks, is asking you to do. Can he or she live with it? It could even be cerebral for that matter. Um, I really think a very careful neurological examination is important. Last but not least, you can't manage a patient based on statistics. The patient you're, you may be seeing may be the one outlier with 99 others who are not the same. So you really have to define the problem before you can describe the treatment of it, if anything. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moses. Points well taken, careful exam and individualizing patient management for sure. So very brief uh, final comment uh, from uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Paul Anderson from Madison. Uh, one uh, clinical aid that was not mentioned is asking about falls. I have a special interest in osteoporosis and uh, orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons do not ask this question enough. Forty percent of people over the age of 65 before they have spine surgery have a fall. 40% after they have spine surgery have a fall. And, and I think we need to include fall assessment as part of this pre-op paradigm, especially in a myelopathic, because obviously risk factors are much higher. Yeah, thank you. Point well taken. So I'm going to close out the symposium, and uh, we can have further discussions over coffee. Thanks uh, to everyone. Good job.